We believe that God is in the business of restoring people and places and neighborhoods all to himself. Um, scripture says that the earth groans from its brokenness. It's literally crying out in its brokenness, wanting to be restored. And I found myself this week crying out in brokenness um, as the different things transpired. Um, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 6 today. You can go ahead and open up there. Or the uh, passage will be on the screen behind me as well. Um, my goal this morning is not to, first let me say, like, when I was talking to people as they came in this morning and stuff, it's such a contrast from last week, right? Last week we had the barbecue and we baptized eight people and we had free barbecue and we had this just this really fun party atmosphere. And you could tell the moment people walked through the door that people were just excited, you know? It was an air of... Um, just anticipation for what was going to happen. And it was a really kind of a free-flowing thing, right? Nobody was felt apprehensive about it. It was like free barbecue and watch people get baptized. That's exciting. Nobody was worried about what was going to happen that day. But the mood was decidedly different this morning. Even as I walked in early this morning and began the process of setting up with our team, and as people began to come in a few minutes ago, and you could just feel off of them the just felt apprehensive. It felt worried. It felt like, what are we going to talk about today? Um, and I know that as we sit here in this room, we're all different colors. We are all have all different backgrounds. Um, we all come from different places. Uh, and my goal this morning is not to tell you how you should feel about what happened this week, about the brokenness that's in our world. My goal is not to tell you what you should do about that. My goal is simply to point all of us to Jesus and try to see what he would have us do in times like these. So Colossians 2, verse 6, um, let me pray. God, uh, wow, what a heavy week. Uh, it seems like violence has been dominating the news cycle, and hate seems to be dominating so much of the discussion around it. And at times like these, I don't know what to do except turn our eyes to you. We're here this morning just to open your word to see what it says. God, I pray that you would just reveal that truth to us and let us walk out of here better equipped to deal with a broken world around us because of your truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Colossians 2, starting in verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. This seems like such a simple verse, but it, in reality, it's really quite profound. The question is, how did we receive Christ, right? It says, just as you received Christ. So how was that? How did we receive Christ? Well, it was by grace. That says it throughout scripture all the time that by grace you have been saved, not by your own works, not by your own doing. It was by grace. So Paul is saying, just like we received Jesus Christ by grace, continue to live our lives in him by grace. So often, I think we treat Jesus like, um, like a driver's license, right? Once we get it, we stick it in our wallet or in our purse, and we never really take it out again until we get in trouble and we have to show it to someone and be like, no, I really am a Christian, I promise, right? <laughs> Jesus, he really is with me. I, I'm gonna go to heaven. We know that he gives us the right to drive the car, but we're the ones driving the car, right? We just have him in our pocket, and we're gonna do things in our own power, in our own strength, in our own way, because... In reality, God's got a lot of stuff going on, right? We know what's best for us. We know how to lead our lives the best way. But Jesus doesn't want to be our driver's license. He wants to be our driver. He wants us to live our lives in him. Paul uses similar uh, language in Galatians 2.20 when he says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. We have been joined with Jesus in this incredible union by the Holy Spirit. God, by his spirit, dwells inside of us. And it doesn't just need to be a driver's license to kind of give us permission to live however we want and in our own power and all of that. It needs to be a true union where we're letting him lead through us. In this metaphor, we should be the car. We should simply be the surrendered instrument that Jesus is driving, that Jesus is using to accomplish his purposes. But the problem is that so often we don't allow Jesus to lead in our lives. We know that we have received Christ by grace, but we try to live 
our lives on our own strength. But Paul is saying the same way you received him, live in him. You received him by grace, live by grace. We put him in our back pocket and only bring him out when things go wrong. I was in seminary for three years. Um, seemed like eight. It was a really long time. Um, but I was in seminary for three years. And in those entire three years, I'm just being very honest with you. I think I read the Bible less than five times for non-academic purposes. I, my whole life was opening the Bible and dissecting it and using it and trying to figure out what it said and looking at the original languages and all of that kind of stuff. And I've literally probably less than five times in three years, I opened it and said, God, speak to me. Show me what you would have for me in my life. I prayed, yeah, but 95% of my prayers were when the test was being handed out. And I thought, God, if you love me, give me a good grade on this test, please. He was in my back pocket, like a driver's license or like a genie. I took him out whenever I needed something, whenever I needed a little help. I only prayed when I needed him to fill some gap that I couldn't do myself. When I was finally at the end of my rope, I brought him out and said, okay, fix this. And then whenever it got fixed or whenever it got accomplished, I'd put him back and I'd go back to doing my own thing. And you know what? I was miserable for most of those three years. Miserable because that's not the way we're supposed to live our lives. We're supposed to live our lives in him. Verse seven explains more about what this really means. Paul says, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. We're supposed to be rooted in him. The, the metaphor here is a tree, right? If you know a lot about trees or know next to nothing about trees, I bet you know that trees have roots and that the roots go into the ground. And the ground is where, the, the, the ground soil is where the tree get all, gets all of its nutrients. It's where it gets the water and the, the tree food that it needs to grow. <laughs> I don't know. That's where everything happens. That's how a tree grows when its roots are in the ground. You know what happens when a tree grows its roots into something else? It dies. It has no life there. We are supposed to be rooted in Christ because that's where our very life resides. When we're rooted in anything else, we don't have power. We're rooted in ourself and our own strength, it ends. And very quickly, it runs out. But when we're rooted in Jesus, we get our life, our strength, our very breath from him. Paul says, not only are we rooted in him, we are strengthened in him. The ability to do anything of eternal value comes through Jesus. We're gonna produce any fruit, any, any good thing of any kind. It has to come the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit working through us. I've talked about this before. You've probably heard of the fruit of the Spirit described in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I've said this before and I'll say it again, but these are not called the fruit of hardworking Christians. These are not called the fruit of very good churchgoers. These are called the fruit of the Spirit. And they're only possible when Jesus, by his Spirit, is working through you. They're not your fruit. It's the Spirit's fruit. But my guess this morning is that this information isn't all that earth-shattering for you. right? If, if you're a Christian, or even if you're not, you probably believe and you know that Christians think Christ is the center of it. Christian means literally little Christ, right? You're supposed to live our lives in him. We're supposed to get our power, our strength from him. This is not new information for many of us. But if we know that, why do we have a, such a hard time living it? Like Paul said, if we know that by grace we have received Christ and that by grace we're supposed to live in him, why can't we do it? Well, ironically, the people of Colossae had the exact same issue. They'd been taught the same gospel that we had, the fact that Jesus came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and then gave us his life by his spirit as a free gift. They'd heard all of that. They had believed in the same gospel that we have believed in, and they still struggled to place their faith and trust daily in Jesus. They trust him for eternity, but they don't trust him for the everyday. I think we can probably identify with that, right? How do we trust him every single day of our lives? How do we allow him to work through us instead of trying to do things in our own strength? 
Look at how Paul begins to teach them to trust in the power of Jesus in verse eight. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Paul tells the people of Colossae that there are these philosophies out there that depend on something other than Jesus. Remember, I told you that in Colossae, right, in this new church, there were these outside teachers coming in and teaching that it was, yeah, maybe Jesus was okay, but you had to do these other things. You had to go these other places. You had to accumulate this knowledge. You had to rely on yourself. There were all these empty philosophies that people were teaching. Paul says these philosophies were based on human tradition or translate another way, the reasoning of humanity. This was based on our own knowledge, our own abilities. At its most basic form, simply the lie tells us we know everything. At its most basic form, this is simply the lie that tells us we know everything. That's all it is. At its most basic form, this is the lie that tells us that we know everything. It's a lie that's born out of pride. It's built up in self-importance. This lie is so prevalent because it's rooted deep down in our flesh. We all experience this. If you don't believe me, just open up social media and see how much people really think they know exactly what they're talking about. Open up the comment section on any article that was written this week and you'll find a lot of experts on police officers and racial reconciliation and what it's like to be an African-American in this country. You'll find a lot of people who know exactly what they're talking about. To be honest with you, I'm probably as guilty of this as anyone. I can be so eager to share my opinion with someone that I don't even listen to what they have to say. Ask my wife. <laughs> I do it all the time. There's been time after time that I get home and I'm talking to Amy and she'll be telling me about something that is happening in her life, some issue she's dealing with or whatever. And as soon as I hear whatever I need to hear, I start to figure out what I'm gonna say and then I just kind of stop listening to the rest of it. I wait for my turn to talk so that I can share my perfect opinion and fix whatever issue that there is and I can look like the hero, right? I'm probably the only one that's ever done that. I see a lot of people patting their husbands on the leg their wives. This is something that is a part of us, right? It's a part of our flesh. It's a part of what is our old self, this need to know everything, this need to share our opinions with people, this need to have people look at us and think, man, that person is really smart. They know what they're talking about. I was reminded, though, of my need to listen before I speak this week in a big big way. But I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. The word captive that Paul uses here in verse 8 gives us a really accurate picture, a word picture of what really happens when we try to fill our lives up with this lie, this lie that we know everything. This type of pride-filled thinking keeps us trapped in our own intellect, operating completely out of our own strength. We don't experience any self-improvement because we are too self-important. Catch that. We don't experience any self-improvement because we are too self-important. All we do is talk and never do we listen. Why would we humbly approach God and others when we have so much to be proud of in our lives? I, you've, I'm looking at it, you guys. I know a lot of you. You've accomplished a lot of things. You're doing pretty well for yourself. Heck, you're here on a Sunday morning in church when you could be out on the lake or you could have slept in. You're doing pretty good, right? We are held captive by this pride. It doesn't let us go. It holds us prisoner. And it's more damaging than we could ever Imagine. Pride and arrogance are talked about all throughout the Bible. The most famous one probably being Proverbs 16, 18. It says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. James 4, 6 tells us that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 26, 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. 
And in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, he says, in humility, count yourselves, excuse me, count others more significant than yourselves. I didn't even wanna read that correctly because of my pride. <laughs> in humility, count yourself more important than others. That's not what it says. In humility, count others more significant than yourself. These are just four examples, but the Bible literally speaks hundreds of times to this problem, this captor of pride. Why shouldn't we be proud, right? Like I said, we've done pretty good for ourselves. Well, just a few verses after Paul's warning, he reminds us just why we should be so humble and why humility is really the only response for a Christian. Look at verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. You were dead. You were dead and Christ made you alive. You didn't make you alive. Your good works didn't make you alive. Your intellect didn't make you alive. Your abilities, your possessions, your relationships, none of those things made you alive. God made you alive and you were dead before that happened. And he did so through Christ's death, burial and resurrection. God canceled the charge of our legal debt. I love that. Does anyone know what Jesus's last words were when he was on the cross right before he died? John 19, 30 records them. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. The phrase, it is finished in the Greek language, which the scripture was originally written in, it's only one word. It's tetelestai. It's one word. And another way that it can be translated is paid in full. That's what tetelestai means. Now in the times of Christ, just like today, people paid taxes. And every year they would get a bill, a tax bill for how much they owed. And they would take it home and they would, you know, scrounge their money together. And when they went back to go pay that tax bill, if they had enough money and they turned it into this tax collector, he would write tetelestai across the top of it. Paid in full. You didn't owe it any more. Literally, papyri receipts from the first century have been recovered with the word to telestai written on top of them. Here's the truth that I do not want you to miss this morning. We have all been given a bill that we cannot pay. Perfection was required of us and every single person who has lived, is living, or ever will live has fallen short of that. But Jesus didn't ask you to pay your own bill. He took your bill to the cross and he wrote with his blood, with his crimson blood that we just sang about, he wrote to Telestai over it, paid in Full. I love the way Paul says it in verse 14. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. What in the world do we have to be prideful about? You didn't pay your bill. You were dead. He made you alive. He wrote to Telestai across of it. He paid for it. And he paid for it in full. How could we possibly approach life from a place of arrogance when we have been given totally unmerited grace from Jesus? The church should be setting the example on humility. We should be modeling how to listen to people before we speak to the rest of the world. Like I said earlier, I was really reminded of this in a big way this week. Um, this week has been one marked by, by violence, by tragedy, by chaos. Um, on Tuesday in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Alton Sterling was shot and killed by police officers outside of a local convenience store where he was selling CDs. On Wednesday in Falcon Heights, Minnesota, Philando Castile was shot and killed by a police officer during a traffic stop. 
On Thursday night during a Black Lives Matter demonstration in Dallas, a sniper shot 14 people, most of them being police officers, and five of the police officers who were shot died from their wounds. Their names were Brent Thompson, Michael Kroll, Patrick Zamaripa, Lauren Ahearns, and Mike Smith. Seven lives in three days wiped off the face of the earth because of what? I don't know. The brokenness of our world. It seemed like each day I would wake up and I heard about another incident, another death. And I would be overcome with emotion and confusion. I began thinking, how do I make sense of this? In light of a God who sits over everything, who is sovereign, who loves us and is in control, how does this kind of stuff happen? And then I began thinking, how do I respond to this? And I'm sure that so many of you have been thinking the same thing. After I heard the report of Alton Sterling's death, I began to rewrite the message for today. And I didn't stop rewriting the entire week. Literally, I woke up every morning and it was a new thing. It was a new thing. It was a new thing. And I would rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. And I'm, I'm not joking with you. This is the most revisions I've ever made to a message because I just, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to respond. And on Friday morning, I was driving home after having breakfast with a close friend of mine and I was feeling so lost and overwhelmed by everything. I'm praying as I drive and I'm asking God, God, show me what to do. Help me with my latest sermon rewrite. Help me speak your truth to people on Sunday morning. Really, I'm just begging him in my own life to help me make sense of all of this. And as I drove, I began to feel just this overwhelming weight of inadequacy. This understanding that I didn't understand. God began to show me that I couldn't figure out what to do. I couldn't make sense of all of this because I was trying to make sense of it in my own power. I was trying to fix it in my own strength. I was trying to process it in my own intellect. And he simply showed me, you can't do that. You don't have the ability to do that. So I began to ask God to lead me in what my next step should be. And as I did, he reminded me of Galatians 6, 2, which says, bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. And I realized that I needed to start listening more and start talking less. I began reaching out to some friends who were intimately affected by this week's event, some, some black friends, some police officer friends, and just asking them to tell me their story, asking them to tell me how they were feeling, what they were walking through. And as we wrap up this morning, I want to share with you a couple of things that came out of that, two quick stories of two people that I talked to. The first one um, is one of my very best friends, and uh, I've known him for a really long time, and um, He's a, an African-American guy, and he just had um, his first child, a brand new baby boy. And when I asked him kind of how it was going, what he was feeling, how he was working through all of this, he told me that he had wept that morning as he held his son, knowing that he will have to teach his son a different way to honor and obey police officers than some have to and knowing that that still might not be enough. That was his experience. A second story is from a couple of college friends um, who got married and the husband became a police officer and I reached out to them this week and I talked to the wife and she said, quote, I'm a believer, so I feel like it is wrong to continue to live in fear, but I went to bed in tears last night thinking some person would come and shoot up my house and kill my little girls because there was a cop car outside. I, I have no idea what it's like to live under the threat of violence because of my skin color. I can't fathom having to teach my son a different way to obey police officers and still know that it might not be enough. I have no idea what it's like to cry myself to sleep at night because there is a cop car parked out front. Because my spouse has 
committed to serve and protect people. I have no idea what it's like to fear for my life because of the uniform that I put on every day. I have no idea what that's like. But I do know that I'm called to bear the burdens of my brothers and sisters, no matter their skin color or occupation, no matter my political beliefs, no matter how I feel about something, this is a reality that our brothers and sisters are living with every single day. And if you don't understand it, that's okay. But you need to listen to people that do. You need to ask them their stories. And you need to speak less and listen more. And I can tell you that because I learned that in a whole new way this week. Grieve with them, sit with them, bear their burden, hold their pain so that they don't have to walk through it all alone. So what's our next step? What should we do out of this? I told you at the beginning this morning, my goal is not to t try to tell you how to feel, to try to tell you what you should go and do, to tell you how you should act. I want to try to just point us to scripture and see how Jesus reacted to things like this and then give you kind of a framework for just how to work through these things as we move forward because that's just what God gave me this week when I was crying out for something. I wanna share three things with you. The first one is pray. The thing that we need to always, always start out with is prayer. And we very simply get this from the model of Jesus. Anytime that he was going through something difficult, anytime he was dealing with a struggling with something during his life on earth, he took time to get away and be with the Father. Every single time we see him, he goes out on a boat, he goes into the garden, he gets away from the disciples and he communes with the Father. He says, God, what do I do? You are my source, you are my life, help me. He prayed. So the first thing we need to do is pray. The second thing I think we need to do is listen. We need to talk to people. We need to bear one another's burdens. We need to listen to them and learn from them. We need to ask them questions. I, I think you should ask somebody of a different race out to lunch or coffee this week. Ask them how it's been going. Ask them how they're feeling about these things. Grab a few minutes with a police officer and ask him what it's like to walk a day in their shoes because the reality is we don't know. Most of us in this room, we do not know what that's like. We can't understand because that's not who we are. Don't let the lie that tells you that you know everything keep you from listening to people, from hearing their stories. Don't let it get in the way of what God wants to teach you through others. Pride is the enemy of wisdom. So the first thing we need to do is pray. The second thing we need to do is listen. And then I think the third thing we need to do is act. Pray, listen, act. Ask Jesus by his spirit to lead you on what to do next and then step out in faith and do it. I'm not gonna tell you what it is to do because I don't think that I have some special revelation from God to tell you how to act in this situation, but I can tell you that if you're a Christian and you have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you, he wants to do something through you. And it might look different for me and it might look different for you, but he wants to do something through you. And when you step out in faith and act, do so with confidence because Jesus is leading you and he is powerful enough to accomplish it through you. Because at times like these, Jesus doesn't need to be your driver's license. He needs to be your driver. He is the only one who can help us navigate through this life. And I promise, I promise that he is enough for us. He empowers us to pray. He empowers us to listen and he empowers us to act. Jesus is our only hope and he is enough. We're about to sing a song together that says just that. Christ is enough. And as we stand together and we sing this truth, rest in the fact that he really is our only hope in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of of a week like this. He is our only hope and he is enough.